And now to bring us home for this morning plenary, three folks who are really rooted in the way that money ties us all together, that the power of these markets is in connecting us, in making the world better for all of us. I want to welcome to the stage Michelle Long, Matthew Stinchcomb, and Jessica Norwood. How do I turn this slide? <laughs> the slides aren't working, whoever can hear that. Is it working up there? Oh, now it's going. Hi, good morning. Wasn't that beautiful? Wasn't that so beautiful? Oh my God, that's what we're capable of as humans. We have that kind of beauty as part of us. We are that capable of that much beauty. Um, that was a perfect opening uh, to this session here. I'm Michelle Long with the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Bali. We work with communities of entrepreneurs all across North America who believe that um, people, well, people um, like Matt Stinchcomb who works in New York and Jessica who works in Alabama, and they're each going to share a story after I share more. But everybody in our community believes that believes that the um, challenges that we face today come from the perilous separation from disconnection, from not knowing uh, where our food came from or how it was raised or who raised it before it ends up on our plate and where the waste goes at the end of the meal or what's happening to our money in a mutual fund when it's spinning around the world and whether it's causing harm or good. And we are about reconnecting investors and entrepreneurs and um, businesses with the communities and the ecosystems upon which they depend. And what I come to today feeling is we're being called to a whole new level of connection beyond business as usual. Um, I was embarrassed this week, this last week, my daughter said to me, she said, Mommy, um, e even, if, um, even though the soil and the seeds, you could grow food and you could, you could cut a tree and make a house, um, you still have to have money, don't you? Because um, you, because you have to ha have money to buy the land. And I felt embarrassed because that's not the way it was given to us. Presumably the world was given to all of us equally, the sunshine and the seeds and the soil. And, um, but some people got there first, or at least at some point they put a fence around some things. And then others now need money to get access to it, even though it's really supposed to be for all of us. And, and if you think about it, um, today I saw a study recently saying that it will take 228 years for the average African-American family to have as much wealth as a white family in this country, even if white families quit amassing wealth. And legalized slavery was 235 years in this country. Um, another story that I would share is um, from a friend who uh, works with us at Bali in a community in Minnesota from um, Jay Badhart Bull. He's Lakota. And he was saying to me um, the, the challenge he has sometimes of um, of going to ask for money from foundations for his community, uh, for the, 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 the trauma in his community. And he said, because culturally it's strange to bow before the one who has hoarded the most money. That culturally, in his culture, an honorable man is the one who's given it away, who sees some need and, that's where, and he gives it all away. So at the end of his life he has nothing. That's who you bow before. Um, I had, I've told some of you this before, but I actually had an epiphany at SOCAP a couple of years ago, and I think it's worth repeating. I was here at SOCAP a couple of years ago, and I started to realize how many people that were here to save the world were um, like sharp elbowing each other over saving the world. You know, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the top of the green building pile, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm going to run sustainable agriculture, me, and uh, I am going to dominate the cooperative market and own the love economy. And I was like, oh. Um, things aren't going to be all that different, actually. Um, and Van Jones said that well. He said, if we don't change how we treat each other, um, so we may have a green economy, but we'll be going to war for lithium for batteries instead of oil for cars. Um, and, and that's what we, what, we, what we really want to talk about here today. Um, I don't want to hear from anybody. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter it, um, whether or not people uh, know, have an intentionality to do good, like what Jed was saying before. All that really matters, if they're, if they're making money, if they're getting rich, um, they're doing impact. It actually does matter. Um, Horrible things have been done in the name of free-range chicken or microfinance. If you move beyond the actual caring for the chicken, if, beyond the actual caring for the people, beyond the actual relationship with the land, um, intentionality absolutely matters. And I feel right now um, that we are um, 
in a time where fear is stoked in our country, where literally like with Standing Rock, we see right now corporation versus life, indigenous versus extractive, right now before us. And it's, us, it's up to us in business and investment to stand for something better, to stand for connection. For 15 years, uh, Bali's been working with uh, communities of entrepreneurs all across North America. And we hear really that in many ways, things have never been harder with this globalized economy. Here's just two examples, people fighting back, doing great work, uh, but it's hard. Um, in, in Wisconsin, the Encourage Foundation, some of you may know Kelly Ryan, she's here. Um, they, they had a, a, a town that really all the jobs came from the local paper mill. And overnight, the paper mill decided to move and 40% of the jobs left. And they acted as a community foundation quickly and radically, and they moved all their assets toward investments in their own communities, out of Wall Street and toward investments in their own community. Um, another example is Food Lab, a group we work with in Michigan. And when they saw the auto industry leave and Motown leave, and uh, what do you do when, when, when everything, when the economy has collapsed? Well, you grow food again. You go to empty lots and you grow food and you start to process food. And, and I've been there and visited with them with all the, the, the hardships. You know, the permitting office closed down, the government permitting office closed down, and it was a guy working from home. You called to try to get a permit for your business and his files are at the office. And you can't get access to any commercial kitchens. The buildings are boarded up. But I went and was with these entrepreneurs and they're singing in rounds. They're singing like, row, row, row your boat, rounds. Um, making the bread, making the bread. Watching it rise, watching it rise. Food Lab Holla, Food Lab Holla, doing this round. Like we are taking care of each other. We're taking care of our communities, but it's hard out there. And economic development dollars don't support that today. 75% of the $70 billion in economic development dollars we spend at the local level goes to subsidize large corporations. Even though all of the net job creation the last 30 years has come from businesses under 20 people. That's SBA data all of the net job creation. And yet that's not how we are spending our money to, to uh, what, what we're supporting. Across North America, we're working with communities who basically do these things. I mean, it's as simple, this is on our website. Uh, they're acting local to make more of what they need at home. They're prioritizing equity and the regeneration of the natural world. They're collaborating. Uh, they're, they're, they're working to ensure that the support of many, many owners in a community, they're shifting capital and policy to support these. It's very simple, really. Um, to build healthy, equitable local economies, like Gandhi said, there's enough for everybody's need, but nobody's greed. Um, but this last point is the one that I want to um, use the rest of my time to share about, this um, cultivating connection. Do you all know Danella Meadows? She wrote Limits to Growth. Dana Meadows? Some of you are shaking your head yes. Um, I went back to her famous uh, paper recently on the 12 levers of systems change. And the top lever, the top lever of systems change that she names is the mindset out of which the system arises. Because we then will design a system that supports that mindset about what we believe about who we are and about what's fair. Um, and then we design institutions that support those systems. And then we design policies and procedures that support those institutions and those systems. But the number one lever for systems change is the mindset out of which the system comes. Um, and the, the beautiful part to me is that over the last 20 years, the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley here in California, they've been doing research into what makes people happy, what makes us feel good, what makes us well. I guess for a long time there's a lot of research on what made people depressed, but not on what made us well. And they found in common, all people, all people share in common four things make us well, regardless of demographic. We feel good when we feel connected to some sort of why we are here, our own purpose, our own voice, we're connected to ourselves. We feel good when we feel connected to each other, we feel good when we feel connected to the natural world, and we feel good when we've been compassionate or generous. Um, connection, interdependence, interconnection is actually our common humanity. That is what makes all people well. So that gives me great hope, um, because that is who we are, and it can be cultivated. Um, so these are the kinds of innovations that I would love to hear this week um, while we're all together. Aravind is an eye care company in India. And they have a mission statement to end needless blindness. And uh, in India, they came to realize over time, as they worked on themselves as leaders of this company, um, 
a lot of our customers actually can't afford uh, what we offer. And so zero is a legitimate price point for our, some of our customers. And so now they actually find people, if they want to end the need of this blindness in India, they find people, they put them on a bus, and they bring them, and they house them, and they feed them, and they care for them, and they figure out other ways to make money in their business. Another innovation comes from my friend uh, Leslie Christian. She's a wealth advisor and a colleague of mine. And she, how, how she's advising people nowadays is, uh, what level of uh, interest should you have on your money? Well, that, that depends on how much money you started with. If you have uh, $15,000 net worth in your family, we need to help build some assets for your home. Uh, if you have $50 million, we want to set an interest rate that slowly moves that money away from you into places where it's needed more over time. Um, I've recently heard more from the Mars Corporation, you know, kind of not very quality candy bars, that big company, um, th that they are actually looking at what is the point of the extraction of profits to the top? How did this ever even come up? I mean, that, it actually doesn't make any sense that we are pulling all the value to the top of the company when the value is being created at each level in the soil where, this, where the cocoa beans are grown, in the, uh, in the people who pick the cocoa beans at each level, that that's where the, the value should go. And so what we are aiming to do over this next um, uh, uh, six months is we're starting with a, with a big group of us, the people that are on the stage, um, Kaiser Permanente, Eileen Fisher, Etsy Foundation, to start what we're calling connection circles, um, an effort to try to uh, remind ourselves of our better natures and who we are. Audre Lorde says we have to struggle to be tender with each other until it becomes a habit, um, that it's our right and responsibility to practice and imagine the world that we want. And so we will be sending you each month, anybody that wants to join with us, a uh, practice and a parable, a, a parable, a story, a story of business that's done better, like some of those that I just named, and a practice that you can use to connect with yourself, with the natural world, with each other, or with your ability to be generous or compassionate, those things that actually make us well. And together, um, we are going to stand for um, a revolution that's, that's necessary. I think that if we don't actually radically reimagine, are we going to be, I don't know if we're going to make it. You know, I honestly don't know if we're going to make it if we don't radically reimagine, if we don't practice having new eyes. Um, <clears throat> we're facing a world right now with climate refugees, um, with the talk of, you know, driverless cars, even though that driving is the number one employer of men in this country, um, of, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was an Onion article when I saw all those governors in this country saying that they didn't want refugees to come to their states. Did you all see that? That they, there were governors saying they couldn't, they didn't want refugees? Refugees? I mean, isn't that very, by its very nature? These are people who are leaving war. They have nowhere to go. Of course, they'd rather be at home. Half of them are children. And so if we can't feel that, if we can't feel that, we have to practice. We have to practice. Because there's reasons why we maybe can't feel it, why our hearts are guarded. And that's okay. You know, it's hard for me sometimes. We've got to practice. And so we can practice with each other, standing for who we really want to be. There's a lot of this happening in um, the, mov the movement for black lives. Um, Domestic Workers Alliance, it's a movement for empathy in healthcare, social and emotional learning in schools. But unless business and investment does it, it's, it's going to be all for naught, you know? If we don't change our economic system, that's what's destroying everything that's precious. So I'd so, so welcome and invite you to, to join with us. You can do it at this website. And I'm going to now turn it over to um, my friend Jessica. And Jessica, you are going to share a story or a parable with us. Thank you. I think everybody in the back just said, uh-oh, because I was supposed to be seated. So they said, uh-oh. Um, my name is Jessica Norwood, and I am really privileged to uh, take on what it is that Michelle just shared about the importance of connection and community and place and culture. And um, specifically, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of my work around um, supporting entrepreneurs <clears throat> who are looking for startup kind of capital, and particularly African Americans. And um, one way that I think really illustrates everything that Michelle just beautifully talked about um, was this project that I got a call for. A group of African American farmers in Alabama had a multi-million dollar contract on the line, and they had been networked together to, uh, uh, to grow fruits and vegetables. And, um, 
as you can imagine, some of the rigors of being able to provide fruits and vegetables for this big box company was really quite stacked for these folks. And so uh, we decided we would put together some, a loan fund and we wanted to make sure that uh, folks had the kind of money that they needed at the different places uh, along this venture. And so we, we did this and I was, you know, pat myself on the back like, yeah, I did it. And um, nobody was taking the, the, the product like I thought. I mean, we had had all these planning meetings and nothing was happening. And I ended up getting an opportunity to sit down and talk with a man named Mr. Robert. And Mr. Robert is uh, about 80 years old, very strong, African-American man, had been farming, and he grew up as a sharecropper. And at a certain point in his life, uh, he decided that he wanted to uh, take on uh, continuing to farm. And the owner of the property had since passed away and the, the land had been turned over to the children. And they didn't have any more interest in continuing the farming. And so he went to them and he said, you know, uh, very limited education, had done odds and ends kind of jobs, but mostly had worked on this plot of land and went to them and asked um, if he could purchase the land where he was. And children agreed and they said, go over to the next county and talk with our, our banker and they'll set you up. And so he went over and did that. And for 15 years or so, he made payments every month. He kept a little ledger uh, at his house of how much he was paying. And at the end of that 15 years, he goes back to the, to the county, to that banker, and he says to them, you know, I am, um, I'm here to get my, my ownership papers. So the, the, the banker says, oh, yeah, uh, well, tell you what you do. You come, come back next week, and we'll have everything set up for you. So he comes back next week. Sir, I'm, I'm here to get the ownership papers. And he says, come back. Keeps coming back until he finds out there was no record of the payments. He had just been paying year after year after year in a very systemic and really egregious abuse of relationship and power to take his land and to take his money. And this is coming from a person who, as an African-American, had gone through uh, some of the, the, the very most vicious times in our country and certainly um, had experienced, even at the hands of the federal government, uh, being redlined and, and, and excluded from getting access to money. So the reason he wasn't keen on taking the product that we had was because he had this historical relationship with this kind of financing. And it was only until I understood that, that we slowed down long enough that we established that level of connection and deep trust was I able to actually understand where he was coming from and to put something together that really mattered for him and for all of the other farmers that were a part of that initiative. And I'm very proud uh, that he became one of the folks who really went out there and made sure that everybody signed up and took advantage of what it was that we were trying to offer. And we were able to help them take advantage of a huge opportunity to work with a big uh, uh, box uh, store uh, in the region. But I think it perfectly illustrates uh, what Michelle has shared about the importance of connection, the importance of really grounding and anchoring in place, and all of the incredible things that all of you are doing out there to move capital, that these are the real stories and the real experiences that people go through that they need you to show up and to really understand what it is that's been happening with them and to provide the kinds of solutions that make sense for where they are. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's always uh, so tough to follow you guys. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that we do and really what it means to do good work and uh, what I've learned uh, over the last 10 years at Etsy.com and the last year at Etsy.org. So uh, my name is Matt Stinchcomb, and I, I run an organization that's now called Good Work Institute. Uh, last week it was called Etsy.org. Uh, <laughs> so that's a new evolution. Um, and we're called that because we actually kind of sprung from the rib of Etsy.com. So um, Etsy's mission is to reimagine commerce in ways that build a more fulfilling and lasting world. And uh, I actually wrote that mission. I spent 10 years working on trying to fulfill this mission inside of Etsy. And uh, I kind of came to the conclusion over time that 
while I think we were doing a lot of really great work, and Etsy continues to do a lot of great work, that the, the business community at large wasn't really going far enough. And so I thought about if we want to change commerce, if we want to change business, uh, then we need to change business education. Um, what I believe, it's not just what's being taught, but how we're teaching, who's teaching, who's being taught, all of these things. And um, here's why. I feel that we're not really fully, fully taking into account the harm that we're causing ourselves, our loved ones, our employees, our neighbors, our planet. Because by putting financial return above everything else, and I know that you know, it's, we all look at not just a single you know, form of capital that's a return, but that always seems to be the one that's the most important, even the, in the most enlightened organizations. We're all on some level actually contributing really to the world that we're trying to avoid. And that, like Michelle said, we really need to do something that's radically different. And so I started thinking about, you know, what is it that it's going to take to actually do this? Uh, and in my mind, what we need is a shift in consciousness. Uh, we need to actually, like Michelle or like Danella Meadows was saying, that we need to start there. And we need a shift in consciousness that shifts uh, the view that we are separate from nature or that we are separate from all of the people in our communities and that our success is somehow independent from the success of nature or the success of other people. And that's the view that we need to cultivate now that's going to allow us to do the work that's radically different. Um, so that was the slide for that. <laughs> and here's my next slide. Uh, so this is the Good Work Institute. And the idea is to develop business education programs that cultivate new ideas of what success looks like and develop new ways of knowing and honoring ourselves, the natural world, and all the people in our communities. So I've developed six principles of what it means to do good work. And uh, I want to share them with you now. They're, I've been looking to say, well, what do we mean by good work? And uh, here's what we mean. Um, oh, I forgot that was the slide for that last part. <laughs> Sorry. I had to do this Pecha Kucha talk yesterday that was so nerve wracking because the slides were just going. So I was like, I'm going to be on it today. Anyways, now that no one's moving them for me, I keep forgetting to move them myself. So good work. What is good work? Uh, good work honors nature. We're not separate from the natural world, and we must recognize that there's no economy without ecology. Good work nourishes the whole human. Our work is not just about producing goods and services for money. It shapes who we are, and it's a vehicle for how we express ourselves in the world. And it's our opportunity to engage our full mental, physical, and spiritual faculties, confer, conf, uh, confer joy, and nourish and inspire all. Uh, good work invokes community. It's about relationships. Um, it helps us overcome our feelings of separation and isolation when it connects us to the people and places of our communities. Good work embodies integrity. It always offers products or services that are necessary and ethically and structurally sound. Working with integrity allows us to be transparent as we can be proud of the work that we do. Good work strives to be great and not just big. Uh, so many chase growth for growth sake, everything has to scale. Uh, I like the notion of scaling deeply in a community, that we root our work in our community so that it can support the growth and that our growth is creating benefit for everybody. Finally, good work leaves room for the mystery. Um, you know, I don't think we can say that we know everything that's out play out there, so how do we stay open, curious, and flexible? So in my last 26 seconds, uh, I'm going to say, how do we do good work? I've come up with uh, a very simple process that everyone can try. So my basic thinking is, is that the world is shaped by the consequences of the decisions that we make every day. And a lot of people were talking about the macro level, uh, but I also think we need to talk about the micro level. And that every day we're making decisions in the world, and that's what shapes our economy, or that's what shapes our organization. A business is just the aggregate of all of the decisions that everybody makes there. So to do good work, we need to do three things. Before we make a decision, we need to pause. We need to look deeply at what the consequences of the decisions are that we're about to make. Then we need to make the decision that causes no harm, or the least amount of harm, and the most amount of benefit for as many people as places possible, as possible. And then we need to do that every time we make a decision. Thanks. <laughs>